Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, when I'm talking to the TV camera, I'm not going to wear a mask, and all of us have been immunized, so. Uh, you, you're welcome to step away if you like. The whole, the whole point of a vaccine, CDC guidance is what we're following. Tomorrow night, 18 senators are going to be traveling down to the southern border, traveling down to Texas, to see firsthand the crisis that is unfolding, to see firsthand the over 100,000 illegal immigrants who were detained last month. Uh, last year, you wrote an op-ed in Newsweek uh, entitled, I Prosecuted Police Killings, Defund the Police, But Be Strategic. Do you still believe it is a good idea to defund the police? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, I do not support defunding the police. The impetus for writing that op-ed was to make clear that I do not support defunding the police. And I um, spend considerable time talking about the need to channel resources to uh, places such as um, mental health treatment to alleviate some of the burdens that we place on the doorstep of law enforcement, some of the issues we ask them to wrestle with that are outside their core competency. But, but, but Ms. If Ms. Park, I, let, let me, and we have limited time, so let me, you say you don't support defunding the police. You just said it twice. The title of your article was defund the police, but let's not just look to the title. Your article begins by saying that the national protests we saw last year, quote, opened up space for transformative policy discussions. You then continue to write, into that space, and this is a quote, into that space has surged a unifying call from the Black Lives Matter movement, defund the police. Do you really believe defund the police is a unifying call? I, I don't support defund the police. Well, I'm reading from your article. Did, do you missed, disagree with your article? I missed the demonstrations and protests. I wanted to provide a different perspective. I don't support taking away resources from police and putting communities in harm's way. We, there's a rise in okay. hate crimes and extremism. Ms. Clark, you, you know you're testifying under oath here. Please Absolutely. allow her to... You, you uh, just said Senator a moment Cruz, ago... Senator Cruz, please allow her to complete her answers. Well, I'm not going to allow her to filibuster, so I'm going to ask a question. If she wants to answer the question that I asked, she can do so, but I'm not going to... She should gonna, be allowed. I hope you'll show respect to the witness. I, I will to, show respect to every you. witness, but we also have limited time, as you're aware, and you've been on this committee long enough to know that witnesses... In avoiding questions, we'll try to filibuster on different topics. So I'm going to ask questions, and I'm going to expect answers to the questions I ask. And I understand the chairman wants to jump in and defend the witnesses, but, but that's your prerogative to try to do I so. I will but defend witnesses on either side and members on either side. We will be respectful in this committee. I hope that all members will. I, 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 I hope and expect the same standard will be, be applied to, to, to senators on both sides. Now, let's return to, you just said... You don't support cutting funds from police. I find that astonishing and, Ms. Clark, frankly, not credible because I'm holding the article you wrote, and I actually pulled out a highlighter and highlighted the beginning of each, each paragraph going through. And about midway through, you have a paragraph that says, we must invest less in police and more in social workers. The next paragraph is, we must invest less in police and more in social support to our schools. The next paragraph begins, we must invest less in police and more in mental health aid. Three paragraphs in your article, you begin with the words, we must invest less in police, and you just told this committee under oath you don't support investing less in police. How do, how do you square those? If, if, I, if I may, Senator, I uh, support the fact that President Biden is committing 300 million new dollars for cop, the COPS program, 300 million new dollars uh, for resources to the police. I wrote that op-ed without having the power of the purse string behind me and talked about how we can allocate a limited pool of resources in a more effective way. So you, but, do you believe you were wrong last year when you called for defunding the police and investing less in the police? It's a poor title chosen by the editor. It's not just the title, it's your text. We must invest less in police. Three paragraphs, you begin with those words. You wrote those words. Do you agree the, with those words today? Uh, without the power of the purse string, I wrote those words, but President Biden is committing more resources to police, and I think that's a great thing, Senator. All right, let's shift to another topic. Your 
advocacy and, in frank, in, frankly, extreme position on defunding the police is paired with a history of not only excusing, but celebrating murderers who have murdered police officers. It's been reported that during law school, you helped organize a conference with speakers who referred to convicted cop killers as political prisoners. This included Mumia Abu Jamal, who murdered a Philadelphia police officer, and Asanta Shakur, who was convicted of murdering a New Jersey state trooper, escaped from prison, and is on the FBI's most wanted list. Did you organize the conference? And do you support celebrating those who murder police officers as heroes and, and political prisoners? Um, the com that conference you're referring to was organized by the late Dr. Manning Marable, a noted historian who led the Institute for Research in African American Studies. I was a student uh, providing support for the Institute, working on a range of projects. Uh, to the second question, Senator, no, I do not celebrate the loss of life. So if you say you didn't organize the conference, why did multiple speakers at the conference thank you by name for inviting them to speak at the conference? Because I was a, a hardworking student that uh, made sure people were fed, uh, mailed out invitations, provided the agenda. I was a, a student providing logistical support to a notable historian who was the one who organized that conference. So if there's a police officer in Philadelphia or New Jersey today watching this hearing, how are they supposed to react to your nomination to one of the senior positions of the Department of Justice, knowing that as a student, you participated in a conference celebrating and lionizing cop killers who murdered a Philadelphia police officer and a New Jersey state trooper? How, how, how should a cop today watching this react to that news? I have never uh, and would not ever celebrate the loss of life or the killing of a police officer, Senator. Not ever. Do you Thank believe you, they're Senator political Cruz. prisoners? Thank you, Senator Cruz. You know, about a month ago, Congress passed out a $1.9 trillion so-called COVID relief bill. Now, only 9% of the bill was health care spending on COVID. 91% was on other stuff. We were there all night fighting against it, introducing amendment after amendment after amendment. Yeah. Yeah. I introduced an amendment, said, all right, you want to send $1,400 checks to everybody. I introduced an amendment to say, let's not send the checks to millions of illegal immigrants in this country. You should be here legally and a taxpayer if you're going to get a government check. We voted on it, and every single Democrat voted no. It failed by one vote. By the way, both the Virginia senators voted no. You know, and look, okay, I, all right. I get it. I understand that they want to send checks to illegal immigrants. I got that. But by the way, you know there's a new politically correct term for illegal immigrant? It's called undocumented Democrat. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to offend the woke police, so I'll, tr I'll try to use the right terminology. So I said, all right, fine. You want to send money to illegal immigrants? All right, here's another amendment. So I introduced another amendment. I said, let's not send stimulus checks to criminals currently incarcerated. If you're in jail, if you're in a six by 10 concrete box, maybe you shouldn't get a check. We voted on it on the Senate floor. Every single Democrat voted no. Failed by one vote. The next week I decided, all right, I get it, you guys want to send checks to criminals. You know who your base is. But let's see if there's common ground on which we can agree. How about, let's narrow it. How about murderers? People convicted of homicide, currently in prison. Can't we agree that if you're a murderer in jail, we shouldn't be sending you a check? 
Democrats stood up and objected, no, we need to send checks to murder. I'm like, all right, you want to send checks to murderers? How about this? Rapists. I introduced another amendment. Let's not send checks to rapists. If you've committed the horrible crime of rape, let's not send you a check. Nope, Democrats objected. I tried one last time. I said, all right, let's go for the worst of the worst. Child molest. These people belong in the ninth circle of hell. By the way, in Texas, we have a penological approach to child molesters. It's called garden shears. <laughs> And you know what? There's a 0% recidivism. <laughs> so I said, let's, can't we agree child molesters shouldn't get a $1,400 check from the U.S. taxpayer? Nope, Democrats stood up and objected. We got to send them checks too. So our government just sent $1,400 checks to millions of illegal immigrants, to murderers, rapists, and child molesters. That's today's Democratic Party. On taxes. If you're paying taxes, your taxes are going up. Income taxes are going up. Corporate taxes are going up. Small business taxes are going up. Capital gains taxes are going up. The death tax is going up. All of them. Madam Chairman. Senator Cruz, I just knew you'd want to respond to uh, that. Well, with all respect, that, that was a wildly inaccurate and partisan assessment of what is occurring. And I would note that this bill was drafted following the 2016 election hmm. after Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. And Senator from Minnesota suggested when a party loses, they reassess their positions. The Democratic Party didn't do that. The Democratic Party insisted for four years that Hillary won and the election was stolen and it was Russia that stole it. And for four years, we heard that over you and over and over You must not have been again. in the same electoral college room as uh, me. Madam Chairman, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking. You voted for okay. the, the Democratic Party did not reassess any policies, but instead, the response to losing that election in 2016 was to introduce this bill to cause millions of illegal immigrants to be registered to vote to vote for Democrats, to cause felons and criminals to be registered to vote to vote for Democrats. And I would note that now in the 2020 election, there were a number of closely competitive Senate races, including in the state of Iowa, including in the state of North Carolina, inclu including in the state of Alaska, uh, including in the state of Montana, that Democrats spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to win, and they lost. And so what does this bill try to do? Change the electorates, and let's get a whole bunch of illegal voters to change the composition of the electorate, along with a partisan federal election commission that will be counted on. The Chuck Schumer Election Commission, like clockwork, there will be an October surprise who are the vulnerable Republicans? Who are Republicans in close races? Boom. The Chuck Schumer Federal Election Commission will announce investigations and, and fines directed against them. This is a brazen power grab by the Democrats because you've decided democracy isn't worth it. You want to fix the game so the voters don't have control over our election. Okay, so I have so much issues with what you just said because I'm thinking back to 2016 uh, when, in fact, Hillary Clinton conceded the election, when in fact we had an electoral college, I know because uh, Senator Blunt and I uh, were in charge of it, and uh, Vice President then, Vice President Biden was presiding over it, and it went through. We didn't object to those results. Then let's fast forward to the day of the insurrection, to January 6th, when in fact you, Senator Cruz, not all of your colleagues here today, you were contesting the electoral college. You were leading one of the leaders on the effort to say that the election uh, results were not correct. Um, and so you wonder uh, why we want to make sure that people have the right to vote. Well, it's because of this kind of rhetoric and this kind of behavior and an insurrection at the Capitol and a former president that is still maintaining that he somehow won the election when we all know it's not true. And so that's why, if you ask why we are still interested in protecting our democracy from that day of January 6th on, I think that's your answer. Well, Chairman Klobuchar, this bill had nothing to do with the 2020 election because it was drafted four years earlier. This bill has everything to do with Democrats trying to rig the election to stay in power and to disenfranchise voters. That's what this election is about. And by the way, Hillary Clinton insisted 
after the election she didn't lose. And not only that, Hillary Clinton advised Joe Biden, under no circumstances should you concede. So, 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 so the ahistorical rewriting uh, 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 of what occurred is, is not accurate. And rigging the system to take away the rights of voters, this is designed to keep Democrats in power for 100 years. And it is fundamentally corrupt, and it is worth noting that when Republicans had a much bigger majority than Democrats have right now, Democrats have a six-seat majority in the House and a 50-50 slimmest possible majority in the Senate, we made no effort to rig the system the way Democrats are doing, and, and that is dis, dishonoring the promise we made to our constituents. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have produced an absolute disaster on our southern border. The crisis that is unfolding is a humanitarian crisis, it is a public health crisis, and it is a national security crisis. Just over a month ago, I led a group of 19 senators to go to our southern border. Representing Texas, I've been to our southern border many, many times. In the Rio Grande Valley, this was by far the worst I've ever seen it. Masses crossing illegally, a caravan, one after the other after the other, and all of this is man-made. We saw facilities that were packed at over 1,700% their capacity in the midst of a global pandemic with a 10% COVID positivity rate in the Donna tent facility where kids were lined up in the Biden cages. For four years, the press talked incessantly about kids in cages, and what was never reported is that Barack Obama built the cages, and Joe Biden is building more cages, they're bigger cages, and they're more full. In those Biden cages, we saw little boys and little girls, not six feet apart as you would want during a pandemic, not three feet apart, not even three inches apart, lying on the floor side by side, no beds, no mats, no cots packed in as tight as they can be, wrapped in emergency reflective materials. Over 10% COVID positivity. The Biden administration barred the press from access. On our trip to the border, ABC News asked to embed with the 19 senators. Fox News asked to embed with the 19 senators. The Biden administration said no, and their reason was COVID. They said one cameraman from ABC was an unacceptable risk of COVID, never mind 4,200 people crammed in a facility with 10% COVID positivity. One reporter, they said, was a COVID risk. We have a number of cameramen and women standing here. You know just how ludicrous that is. By the way, the Trump administration allowed the press in, the Obama administration allowed the press in, the Clinton administration did, the Bush administration did, but not Joe Biden. Joe Biden wants the world to cover up and hide this crisis that he has created. So the 19 senators, we pulled out our cell phones and we filmed and took pictures. The Biden administration sent a political minder from Washington, D.C., who jumped in front of the camera and screamed at senators, do not show these images to the American people. All of this is man-made. Three decisions Joe Biden made. Halting construction of the wall on week one in office reinstating the failed policy of catch and release, and most indefensibly, ending, ripping up the international agreement remain in Mexico that had produced last year the legal immigration in 45 years. Remain in Mexico was an incredible success, so what did Joe Biden do? Ripped it up, and we have right now today the worst illegal immigration in 20 years. 178,000 people came in last month, the month of April. We're on a path to 2 million people, and it's getting worse. This month is worse than last month. Last month was worse than the month before. Every month it's getting worse because they're not fixing it. But as it's getting worse and worse, the corporate media has stopped covering it. You turn on the 6 o'clock news and suddenly the Biden border crisis has disappeared. Now, I recognize there are other crises. We've got a gas crisis playing out. We've got a war in the Middle East. We may have an inflation crisis coming. I agree. Biden policies are failing across the board, economically, domestically, and abroad. 
but that doesn't mitigate the disaster that's playing out on our southern border. In over 100 days in office, Joe Biden has not been to our southern border. Biden named Kamala Harris as in charge of the border. She has not been to the southern border once as vice president. I would say to the folks in the media, anytime you're standing in front of the president or vice president, the very first question should be, why haven't you gone to the southern border to see the crisis, to see the little boys and little girls being physically abused, sexually abused because of your policy failures? And by the way, the reason they don't go, there's an answer to this, is they know if they go, they'll bring TV cameras. They know if they go, the press will be forced to cover it. Kamala Harris has been to the Canadian border as vice president, but not the southern border. The last I checked, we don't have a crisis of thousands of Canucks coming south across the border. This is a dereliction of duty. It is deliberate, and they don't intend to fix it. They don't intend to fix it because they have promised the radicals they will have open borders and they will not enforce our laws and that is endangering the people of my home state of Texas. It's endangering people all across the country. It is unacceptable. It is inhumane. And it's wrong. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Senator. President Biden and the Biden administration have presided over the worst foreign policy catastrophe in a generation. Americans across the nation are horrified. Our servicemen and women, our active duty military are angry, they're disillusioned, and they're frustrated. Our enemies across the globe are emboldened, which makes the world more dangerous today for America, and our allies are dispirited. Ever since the disaster began unfolding in Afghanistan, we've seen the Biden administration making political excuses. We've seen Democrats on this committee explaining at great length how everything that happened in Afghanistan is Trump's fault. It's all Trump's fault. Mr. Secretary, Joe Biden is the President of the United States. Kamala Harris is the Vice President of the United States. You are the United States Secretary of State. Just like Jimmy Carter owns the disaster of the Iran hostage crisis, you own this. The Biden administration caused this disaster. It was caused by two things. Number one, ideological naivete and extremism. Repeatedly, Mr. Secretary, in this hearing and also on multiple conference calls over the last month, you keep saying things like the steps the Taliban needs to take to be welcomed into the community of civilized nations. Mr. Secretary, they don't want to be welcomed into the community of civilized nations. They are terrorists who want to murder us. This administration doesn't understand that. Joe Biden doesn't understand that. But sadly, that ideological extremism was combined with manifest incompetence. There were four decisions this administration made that I think were utterly indefensible. Number one, abandoning the Bagram airfield giving it to the Taliban. That is a decision that 100 years from now will be studied at war colleges as a colossal strategic mistake, giving up two secure airfields, necessitating an evacuation from a dense urban environment, a commercial airport, which led tragic bombings and murders that killed 13 American servicemen and women. Had we been evacuating from Bagram with a secure perimeter, the odds are, are quite high. That attack either wouldn't have happened, or if it had happened, it would have been far less severe in its consequences. Secondly, the Biden administration giving the Taliban a list of Americans and of Afghans we wanted out. Third, the decision to leave Americans behind. Hundreds of Americans, perhaps more, perhaps thousands, thousands of green card holders, tens of thousands of Afghans who assisted the U.S. military. The Biden administration abandoned them and left them behind. And fourth, leaving billions of dollars of American military equipment that the Taliban will now use 
to threaten our lives. Earlier in this hearing, you, you said about that equipment, quote, none of it poses a strategic threat to us or their neighbors. That does not pass the laugh test. When you're looking at the Taliban potentially having 64,000 machine guns, 33 Black Hawk helicopters, 16,000 night vision goggles, we will see American blood spilled because of these colossal mistakes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to start with a question for each of the five witnesses. Uh, in your judgment, are voter ID laws racist? Professor Tolson. Thank you for that question. Um, so it depends. One thing we have to stop doing is treating all voter ID laws as the same. Okay, so your answer, I, I, I want to move quickly, so it depends is your answer? Yes, it that's my answer. Okay, so what voter ID laws are racist? Apologies, Mr. Cruz, your state of Texas, perhaps? Okay, you, so you think the entire state of Texas is racist. What about requiring an ID to vote is racist? Um, so I think, sir, that's a pretty reductive. I'm not saying the entire state of Texas is racist. You just said my state of Texas, so you tell me your voter what about the Texas oh, voter absolutely. ID laws is racist. So the fact that the voter ID law was put into place to diminish the political power of Latinos uh, with racist intent and it, had been found to have racist You're asserting that. Intent, what's your evidence for that? Uh, the, dist the federal district court that first resolved the constitutionality of Texas's voter ID law. Okay, so your view is voter ID laws are racist. How about you, Mr. Yang? I agree with Professor Tulsa. Voter ID laws can be racist. Okay, that's other context. Mr. Science? There are some voter ID laws that are racially discriminatory in intent. That, how about in, in practice? In intent, I, fine, you, you say there's some racist with, with a malevolent that, intent lurking in the back of their mind. But let's just talk about it as a practical matter. When I go to vote, they ask me for my ID. I pull out my ID, I show it to them, I vote. Is that racist? If the law that requires you to do that was motivated by racially discriminatory intent what, what about the under effect? our set, set aside, constitution. Set aside intent. Set aside intent. I'm that, asking about the effect. Yes, in effect, I okay. think that Ms. there are Reardon. discriminatory effects from a number of voter ID laws. Okay, thank I'm you, Mr. Reardon. I'm going to give the witness a chance to answer the question. Go ahead, Mr. Sign. Yes, in effect, I think many voter ID laws are discriminatory. Okay. And in design, they are designed to have that effect. Okay, Ms. Reardon. No, sir. Mr. Van uh, uh, Spakovsky. Uh, no, particularly because every single state that has passed an ID law has put in a provision to provide a free ID to anyone who doesn't have one. The turnout numbers show it has no effect. And I would remind everyone that the current version of the Texas voter ID law for in-person voting, the Obama administration agreed in court in a court filing that they were satisfied with it and that it was not discriminatory. You know, I have to say that the wildly partisan nature of the Democrats' proposal. The record should reflect all three of the Democratic witnesses invited by the chairman maintain to this committee that voter ID laws can be, in many instances, in most instances, I think of the various ways they formulated, are racist. So let me tell you who disagrees with that. 35 states across the country disagree with that because 35 states have voter ID laws in effect. But not just 35 states. 81% of voters in America disagree with the radical views proposed by the Democrats and the Democratic witnesses. Not just 81% of Americans. 77% of black voters in America support voter ID laws. 78% of Hispanic voters in America support voter ID laws. Maldives should think about that. 81% of low-income Americans support voter ID laws. And yet, what this bill is about is putting radicals in charge of saying, if you require an ID to vote, that is racist and must be struck down. This is all about partisan power. Now, DOJ has also said, under the Biden administration, that it is not going to presume that, state acts that, uh, that a state acts lawfully if it simply returns to pre-COVID voting laws, Ms. Reardon, Mr. Van, Van Spakovsky, what does that tell you if they say after a pandemic, if you go back to the laws that existed before, DOJ is not going to assume that that's okay? Well, what does that tell you about the partisan nature of DOJ? By, um, by, the, by issuing the guidance that they did, it says to me that what they would like to do is make permanent the um, 
emergency procedures that were um, instituted by uh, many states through litigation by the DNC throughout the, throughout the country prior to the 2020 election. And they would like those to be permanent. And so rather than understand that they are temporary, they are going to go after states that design to go back to their original election procedures. Well, and I think they also think Democrats did well under those emergency procedures, and so putting those, keeping those emergency procedures in place will predictably benefit Democrats. You know, I would note, in addition to disagreeing with the vast majority of the American people, the Democratic witnesses and the Democrats here also disagree with, disagree with the United States Supreme Court. When I was the Solicitor General of Texas, I represented a coalition of states defending Indiana's voter ID law uh, before the U.S. Supreme Court, a group of plaintiffs challenged that. It went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, by a vote of six to three, upheld Indiana's voter ID law. Not only did they dis do so, Justice John Paul Stevens, one of the lions of the left, wrote the majority opinion where he said voter ID laws protect the integrity of elections. And yet, sadly, too many Democrats today don't want to protect the integrity of elections. And I've got to say there is a view, particularly from Northeastern Democrats, that they look down on the rest of the country as a bunch of bigots and overalls, their southern cousins who are too oafish to be as enlightened as they are. And I have to say there's an incredible hypocrisy in that, in that states like Georgia and Mississippi have a higher black voter registration rate than states like Connecticut, the chairman's home state. They have higher black voter turnout rates than states like Connecticut. They have a lower gap between black and white turnout than in states like Senator Blumenthal's Connecticut. And in fact, states like Georgia and Mississippi, African Americans voted a higher rate than white voters, and in Texas, they're basically e equal. One of the sad realities of today's Democratic Party is they define race as follows. If you're a Democrat, you qualify. So under the Democratic view, I'm not Hispanic. Senator Padilla is. If you're a Democrat, you're an Hispanic. My, my abuelo and abuela would be very surprised to discover I wasn't Hispanic. But that's how Democrat views it. That's how the radicals in the civil rights division view it. And I will point out as an example, this committee... One new federal district judge in the state of Texas, Jason Pulliam, is an African-American judge nominated by President Trump, sat at this table, presented superbly. The Democrats had no criticism, and every single Democrat on this committee voted against him. Why? Because they perceived him as a black Republican. He didn't qualify as a black man. The Democrats were voting against Judge Pulliam. Do you have one basis to vote against him? Anything you disagree with, none of them had any single answer at all. This hearing's about one thing, it's about power, and it's about ensuring Democrats stay in power. That's cynical, and it's at the expense of democracy and the right of voters to express their will through free and fair elections. Uh, I'm going to ask my questions now and just begin by saying this hearing has nothing to do. I understand this is the first time that TikTok is testifying before Congress, and I appreciate you making the company available to finally answer some questions. In your testimony, you talked about all the things you say TikTok is doing, to protect kids online, and that's great. But I want to discuss the broader issue here, which is the control the Chinese Communist Party has over TikTok. Its parent company, ByteDance, and its sister companies, like Beijing ByteDance Technology. Now, TikTok has stated repeatedly that it doesn't share the data it collects from Americans with the Chinese Communist Party, and that it wouldn't do so if asked. It is also stated that, with regards to data collected on and from Americans, that data is stored in Virginia with a backup in Singapore. But these denials may, in fact, be misleading. A quick look at TikTok's privacy policy, in fact, just last night, shows there's a lot more than meets the eyes. For example, in the, quote, how we share your information section, one blurb reads, quote, we may share all of the information we collect with a parent, subsidiary, or other affiliate of our corporate group. Interestingly, in June of this year, the privacy policy was updated to state that TikTok, quote, 
may collect biometric identifiers and biometric information as defined under U.S. laws, such as face prints and voice prints. Mr. Beckerman, does TikTok consider ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, which is headquartered in Beijing, to be a part of TikTok's, quote, corporate group, as that term is used in your privacy policy? Um, thank you, Senator. Um, this is an important question. I'd, I'd just like to take an opportunity first to clear up misconceptions um, around um, some of the accusations that have been um, leveled against the company. Um, I would like to point to independent research. I understand that trust but, needs to be earned. Mr. Beckerman, I, I get you may have broader points you want to make. My, my question is simple and straightforward. Does TikTok consider ByteDance, the parrot company headquartered in Beijing, to be part of TikTok's corporate group? That's, that's a yes or no. Senator, access controls for our data is done by our U.S. teams. Um, and as independent researchers, independent experts have pointed out, the data that TikTok has on the app is not of a national security importance and is of low sensitivity. But again, we do hold that to a high standard and we have access control. Hey, Mr. Beckman, we're going to try a third time because the words that came out of your mouth have no relation to the question you were asked. Your privacy policy says you will share information with your corporate group. I'm asking a very simple question. Is ByteDance, your parent company, headquartered in Beijing, part of your corporate group? Yes or no, as you use the term in your privacy policy. Senator, um, I, I think it's important that I address the broader point in, in, your, in your statement. So are you willing to answer the question, yes or no? It is a yes or no question. Are they part of your corporate group or not? Yes, Senator, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, so under your privacy policy, you're explicitly stating that you may be sharing data with them, including biometric identifiers, including face prints, including voice prints. Is that correct? Uh, no, no, Senator. In the privacy policy, it says that if we are to collect um, biometric information, which we do not um, collect biometric data to identify Americans, um, we would uh, provide consent and opportunity for consent first. But you also say we may share all of the information we collect with a parent subsidiary or other affiliate of our corporate group, which means with ByteDance head headquartered in Beijing, correct? Under U.S. access control, sir. All right, secondly, what about Beijing ByteDance technology, which media reports from earlier this year showed Beijing took a minority stake in through a state-banked internet investment Chinese entity, and on the board of which now sits Wu Shengang, a CCP official who spent most of his career in Chinese propaganda, including with a stint at the Online Opinion Bureau under the Cyberspace Administration of China, China's internet regulator. Would you consider Beijing ByteDance technology to be a part of TikTok's corporate group with whom TikTok could share all of the information it collects? Senator, um, I want to be clear that that entity has no affiliation with TikTok. Um, it's based for um, domestic licenses of the business um, in China that has, is not affiliated or connected to TikTok. So are you saying no or, or yes or no as to whether Beijing ByteDance technology is part of your corporate group as the privacy policy defines it. It says we may share all of the information we collect with a parent, subsidiary, or other affiliate, and presumably that's where it would fall, other affiliate of our corporate group. Is Beijing ByteDance technology a, quote, other affiliate of your corporate group? Um, Senator, I'm saying that entity deals with domestic businesses within China. It is okay, not connected okay, you're, with you're having a hard time. You're answering questions I'm not asking. Again, it's a yes, no. Is Beijing ByteDance technology a, quote, other affiliate of your corporate group as your own privacy policy defines it? Senator, I'm just, I'm just trying to be clear to answer your question. That entity is based for, in China for the Chinese business that is not affiliated or connected with TikTok. Okay. So that's twice you haven't answered. Let's, last time you did it on the third, third time, so let's try it again. Again, it's a yes, no. The answer is the same, Senator. Which is? What I just said, that, that entity is... Okay, okay. The, 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 what you just said did not answer the question. So let me just repeat the question again. Is Beijing ByteDance technology a, quote, other affiliate of our corporate group as your privacy policy defines it? Yes or no? Senator, as, as I stated, that entity does not have any 
any um, relation to the TikTok entity. So I'll point out it took three questions to get you to answer about your parent. You finally answered yes, that you can share all your information with your parent company based in Beijing. I've asked you three times about this sister company that is obviously another affiliate. You've refused three times. That may be revealing, often as, as Sherlock Holmes observed about, about the dogs that do not bark, it may be revealing that, that, that the Chinese propaganda minister that is serving on your sister company and who's been in the business of online propaganda, you're refusing to answer whether they fall under your privacy policy. That reveals, I think, a great deal, unfortunately. Senator, with, with, with all due respect, um, I'm just trying to be accurate here. There's a lot of accusations that are just not true, and I want to make sure that it's okay, clear. Okay, I'm going to give you one more chance, and my time, time is over. But look, in, in baseball, three strikes, you're out. Tonight, the Astros are going to begin winning the World Series. Let's see if, if a fourth strike, you could actually answer the question. And it's, it's a simple yes, no. Is Beijing ByteDance Technology a, quote, other affiliate of our corporate group as your privacy policy defines that term? Senator, as, as, as I pointed out before, my answer is the same. Yes or no? I, you didn't answer. Senator, I, I appreciate your trying with, um, with gotcha questions. I'm just it's trying it's to be, not a gotcha I'm question. Be, I'm, I'm asking about your policy. I'm just trying to be, trying to be truthful and, a, and I, accurate about the, the connection Are you willing between... to answer this question, yes or no? Senator, I answered the question. You have not answered the question. Is it another affiliate? Yes or no? I, Senator, I, I stated um, a number of times that that entity is a domestic entity within China for licenses there. And, and, is, and, and, is not, and apples and is not are red. You stated something is that is not the to, question is not I asked. Is it another affiliate as defined under your privacy policy? Yes or no? Senator, I answered. You're here this. under oath. Are you going to answer the questions? Or, I answered or you, the question. Is or not, were you instructed not, not to answer this question? No, Senator, I'm just trying you're, you're, So you're just not refusing to answer it because you don't want to? Senator, it is not affiliated with TikTok. Is, is, that's your question, and that is the answer. So, so your answer, I want to be clear because you're under oath, your answer is that Beijing ByteDance Technology is not a, quote, other affiliate of our corporate group as your privacy policy uses that term. This is the legal question with consequence. Senator, I, under, I understand the question. Um, I, as I pointed out, TikTok is not available in China. That is an entity that is for purposes of a license of a business in China that is not affiliated with TikTok. So for the record, you're refusing to answer the question. I believe I answered your question, Senator. Yes or no? Tell me which one it is. Just give me one word, yes or no. <laughs> Senator, I answered, I answered the question. You're not willing to say yes or no? It's not, it was not a, not a yes or no question. I want to be precise. Okay, I, I want to be- I Is wanna... this company another affiliate as defined in your privacy policy? That is binary. There's not a maybe. It's yes or no. Senator, I'm, I'm, the way I answered, I'm not aware that that is the answer to the question. Okay, so you're refusing to answer the question. That does not give this committee any confidence uh, that, that TikTok is doing anything other than participating in Chinese propaganda and espionage on American Senator, that's, children. that's not accurate, and again, I would, I would point you to if it were, If it were not accurate, you would answer the questions, and you have dodged the questions more than any witness I have seen in my nine years serving in the Senate. That is saying something, because witnesses often try to dodge questions, but, but you answer non sequiturs and refuse to answer very simple questions. That, in my experience, when a witness does that, it is because they are hiding something. Your son-in-law makes a very substantial sum of money from a company involved in the teaching of critical race theory. Did you seek and receive a decision from an ethics advisor at the Department of Justice before you carried out an action that would have a predictable financial benefit to your son-in-law? This memorandum is aimed at violence and threats. I, I just violence. asked a question. Did you it seek an ethics? It has no opinion? predictable. Did you seek on, an ethics opinion? It has no. Did you seek an ethics opinion, Judge? You know how to ask questions and answer them. Did you seek an ethics opinion? You asked me whether I sought an ethics opinion about something that would have a predictable effect on something. This has no predictable effect in the way that you're talking about. So, if critical race theory is taught in more schools, does your son-in-law make more this money? This memo has nothing. If critical race theory is taught in more schools, does your son-in-law make more money? Yes or no? This this memorandum has nothing to do with critical race theory Will you answer or if you any sought an other ethics kind opinion? of curriculum. Will you that, answer if you sought an ethics opinion? I am opinion? answering the best I can. Yes you? or no? Did you seek an ethics opinion? This memorandum has Did nothing... Did you seek an ethics opinion? This memorandum has nothing to do with... General, are you refusing theory. to answer if you sought an ethics opinion? I am telling you that there's no possible... So you're saying no. Just answer it directly. You know how to answer a question directly. I'm Did you seek 
an ethics opinion. I'm telling you that if I thought there was any reason to believe there was a conflict of interest, I would do that, but I cannot Why do you refuse to answer the question? Why won't you just say no? I'm sorry. You're not going to answer the question? I'm sorry. Say, ask the question again. Did you seek an ethics opinion? I'm saying again, I would seek an ethics opinion in So no is the answer, correct? What? There was a Senator, your time is up. Let the record reflect the Attorney General refuses to answer whether he thought, sought an ethics opinion, and apparently ethics are not a terribly high priority in the Biden Justice Department. I don't think that's a fair reflection of what I said. Then answer the question. Senator, you've gone way beyond any other senator's time. I think you ought to be at least respectful of other senators at this point. Mr. Chairman, do you know the answer, whether he sought an ethics opinion? I think you have exchanged that so many times, we know where we stand. Why is United's conduct disregarding the rights of your employees so different from the conduct of your competitor air airlines, which are protecting the rights of their pilots and flight attendants and not firing them or putting them on unpaid leave for exercising their religious liberty rights? Well, Senator Cruz, uh, again, we did this for safety. Uh, we believe it saved lives. I think that's my number one obligation is safety, uh, particularly running an airline. And, Do you have and an obligation to your customers? Uh, my number one obligation is safety, um, including to our customers. Are your competitors unsafe? Uh, I think that the world is safer um, for us. I made the decision for United. I'll let the, my competitors speak for themselves. Uh, I made the decision for United uh, that getting everyone vaccinated would save lives and well, would Mr. create Kirby, a safer I will tell you environment this. for all the other workers. My time but I will tell you this. I fly United flight almost every week. Almost without exception, when I'm on one of your flights, I get stopped by a pilot or a flight attendant, often multiple pilots or multiple flight attendants, who say thank you for fighting for us. Your employees are being mistreated and it's disappointing. Your company is better than this and what you're doing is wrong. 